I'm Jen Pascal, and I'm a set decorator. I started in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I was born and raised, and uh, I wasn't sure what I wanted to be. I just didn't quite have a handle on it. I thought I wanted to be a fashion designer at one point, so when I was young, I had a midge. I had the cousin midge. I would make a little outfits for the you know, design little outfits because I never liked the clothes that you could get. So I thought that was my calling. Then when I got older, I thought, maybe I want to be a shrink because everybody would come to me and tell me their problems. My parents hated what they did. They hated their jobs and they couldn't wait to retire. And I thought, I don't want to live like that. I want to, I want to be happy. I want to enjoy what I do. I want to love what I do. I don't know what that is when I was young. I didn't know what that was, but I just wanted to really like it. And my roommate at the time introduced me to some folks in theater. It was a Pittsburgh laboratory theater, and it was just experimental stuff. And I thought, well, this is kind of interesting, but, you know, it didn't really register. And then one day, this uh, my boyfriend at the time said, they need help at Mr. Rogers. You should come down here. And I did, and it changed my life. I started with um, this amazing art director, Jack Guest, who worked in black and white television. And he challenged us to create the colors of the neighborhood of make-believe. So a man who worked in black and white television taught me color. And I'm forever grateful because when I did black and white films, I thought of Jack constantly and I remembered what he taught me. So my first movie was Creepshow, and there were some amazing women, really strong women, and I have this, this beautiful drawing that my friend Ellen Hopkins Fountain did. These three women, Gail Werthner, Eileen Garrigan, myself, and Ellen Hopkins, we were the paint team for Creepshow, and they taught me so much. I was basically the paint scrubber, the paint bucket scrubber. But they taught me how to wood grain, they taught me how to do aging, they taught me so much, and I'm forever grateful to these women. Uh, it was just the most incredible education. You know, one day I was doing a commercial in Pittsburgh, and the company that booked me said, you know, can you do this? And I said, sure. I just threw everything I had in my truck. I had a little red pickup truck. And I said, uh, you know, here I am. I just kind of walked in with nothing. And during the day, the woman said to me, oh, geez, I wish I had a, whatever, a Makita drill. I wish I had smoke cookies. I wish I had a paint empty bucket. And each time she said something, I had it in my truck. And I said, well, I have that in my truck. You want me to get it? And I, by the end of the day, I pretty much emptied my truck into the place. And at lunchtime, they came and said to me, would you like to come to LA and finish this commercial series with us? And I thought, okay. <laughs> they didn't really condone it for a long, long time until well, I did a show with Mel Brooks, who was amazing, and an amazing production designer, Roy Forge Smith. And the movie didn't do as well as we had hoped, but we were really proud of how it looked. It was very Victorian, it was really exciting. When the movie came out, Mel, I, I gave him a present. We found this poster, and it's Lon Chaney and uh, Boris Karloff, and they're in caskets, and they're reading Variety. They're reading all the trades, <laughs> and it was hilarious. So we gave Mel, we framed one and gave it to him, and he wasn't there the day that we dropped it off. So he left a message on my home machine, and my parents happened to be visiting. So I, put, I had two extensions, and I, had, I put one of them on each extension, and I played the, the thing with Mel Brooks saying, you did such a great job, and I'm so happy with how everything looks, and blah, 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 thank you for the present. And my parents' eyes got bigger and bigger and bigger, because it was Mel Brooks talking to their daughter. So that helped, but it didn't, they still weren't on board. We won an Emmy in 2001 for a show called Boston Public, and they came to visit again, and they saw the Emmy, so that was pretty exciting. And then my mom was still around when we were, had our first Oscar nomination for Good Night and Good Luck, and that helped a little. But she still would lament 
once I realized this was it, I was all in. And I'd do anything. When I speak to students, I always say, when they say, how do you get into this, or what do you want to, you know, what do you need to do? And I always say, be a sponge, just observe. You know, you see what people need or what people are asking for, and you figure out how to do it, or you learn or you ask somebody how to do it. Part of being a set decorator is being observant, and you want to absorb any environment that you're in, because you may have to recreate that someday. You know, I just started collecting tools and you know, being a, because I worked with the paint department, I had a bunch of empty buckets and, you know, doing a little job here and a little job there. You know, I had smoke cookies because that was the thing at the time. I had accumulated tools catching on that, that I needed those things to do what I was doing. And so I did props and I did some set decorating and, you know, I just want, I was so hungry to learn that I just would say yes to anything. The way I look at it, we're storytellers. We're here to support the director's vision and the script. And we work with the production designer and we need to figure out how we can tell you where you are and what's going on in the surroundings in a second. You know, the production designer envisions the entire movie with the director and then the set decorators come in and we give it the life inside of the walls or inside of the alley or inside of the auditorium. We bring all the detail. It's really important to me to make the actors comfortable where they are, to make sure that, I, I've had actors come to me and say, thank you so much, now I know who I am. I know who my character is. And that to me is, again, it, it's, you couldn't say a better thing. I love to do historical pieces and period pieces, and we do a lot of research on that. And I always say that I'm, I take all the information in, I do deep dives into research, and I put it all in the blender. And if I can find a way and find a, a key, you know, once, sometimes you just find one thing, and that's like, oh my God, that's the key, that's what unlocks, and everything else falls into place. Argo was just such an amazing experience. It was really a deep dive into an historical event. And for that one, I felt like we all really had this important mission to really tell this story as correctly as we could. The, the documentary that we watched, 444 Days, was just unbelievable. And the more we dove into it, the more we could learn and we were, um, our researcher was communicating with some of the hostages and was re communicating with some of the house guests. So we would provide lists of, lists of questions to ask and those people were so generous to tell us their emotional stories. It was really incredible. But I felt such an obligation to get it right. I came up with this whole list of questions that I had, like what kind of furniture when you were an ambassador, did you take your furniture with you? What did you bring from home? What kind of phones did you have? What was the art on the wall? We had seen a photo of a woman in a burka eating Kentucky Fried Chicken, and Ben really wanted to do Kentucky Fried Chicken, and we just couldn't find any research on it. And some guy from the Tehran American School said, look what, I've, look what I have, and he had a takeout box with the colonel in Farsi, and he posted it in this group. I almost had a heart attack. I remember running out of the office. I said, we've got Kentucky Fried Chicken. And it's actually at Warner Brothers right now. We had some made, and they have it on display in the hallway at Warner Brothers Prop House. You know what? I love his passion. I really love his passion. I think we share that passion. We want to get it right. We want to tell the story right. I remember we were so proud of the bullpen that we did at the CIA. They had all the teletype machines. They literally were printing out the script words about what the status was. So we were really proud to show Ben the set. We were like, we're ready. We're in the basement of the LA Times. It was a completely empty room. We brought in every single thing. And there was this thing that we learned about that the CIA had as a communication device 
and it was bizarre. It, it was vacuum tubes like you see at Home Depot where you, they send the money up in the thing. And so we found the actual company that made this thing at the CIA. We created these tubes and this catch-all thing, and we, f we got the actual tubes that they used to use. Ben came in and said, does it work? <laughs> and we went, um, give us a couple minutes. <laughs> he really wanted the house guests to have a connection to one another. But he made the house guests live in that house for a week with no cell phones and no outside contact. There was a PA in case of emergency, but they lived together for a week, and I just thought that was so brilliant. And it really made them connect to one another, and I think it made the film so much richer. And I was just so impressed by it, as, as freaked out as I was that we had to get the set ready early. You know, I think people need to understand that it takes a village, that I can have all the ideas I want, but if I don't have a crew that is dialed in to the project and to me and to the designer, it's just an idea. I think that respecting all of the talent that they have and that they bring to the table is key and also building relationships. I have great relationships with prop houses. They've helped me so much over the years. History for Hire, Pam and Jim, who own History for Hire, have, I, I don't know how I could have done half the things I've done without them. And I think that people don't really realize, they see a set and they think, we just found a location like that, which is kind of a compliment in a way, in a weird way. <laughs> if people don't notice. But I think it's important to know that the set decorator manages all of that. The whole building. <laughs> I mean, we really gutted the building. Uh, we t tore everything up. The shoe lab was a challenge to buy the shoe last, which we couldn't find in quantity. You know, budgetarily, it was a little bit of a challenge because I had to, we bought some online and then, um, I had to cast them, which is expensive. And it was like, oh my God, but I really had to have it to sell the, 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 that this is the place where shoes are made. And it had, you know, Prefontaine's name on it. And, you know, we had figures, uh, uh, sports figures that Nike built shoes for runners mostly at that time with their names on it um, because that was their foot. The rest of the building, we literally gutted the entire building and um, dressed my almost every office. There were about 40 offices in the end that we ended up dressing. It was, it was challenging. In the 80s, there were still the, the super graphics from the 70s, 80s, and Francois did a great job of doing the super graphics on the wall that really takes you back to that era. So we wanted to continue it in the desk, in the cubicles and the desks, and we did binders in those same colors of the super graphics. So we wanted to just have your eye just continue with those colors. Also in Matt's office, Sonny's office with the tapes. Oh my God, I'm trying to find VHS tapes and VHS players that actually played was a challenge. Just labeling all the tapes on so my crew hand labeled all the <laughs> thousands of tapes, VHS tapes. That was pretty insane. I love what I do. I want to keep doing it for a long time. <laughs> it goes back to be kind, build relationships, listen to other people, respect other departments. I think that that is the key to a lot of filmmaking. That when a group, when you're building that community, respects one another and the time it takes to do each other's job and the space that they need to do it and what the, the equipment or whatever they need to do it. I think that that's really important to just base everything on respect and appreciate the people around and what they do and how they do it.